Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. So on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you for being to the Sixth Calm Conference. So today's tutorial, I'm going to present you the menu of today. We're going to have four tutorials. First one, from one to multiple data tables with multi minor. Second one, multivariate analysis of ecological data with EDA4. Third one, multidimensional scaling using majorization with Smakoff. And the last one, correspondence analysis with CA. So what is common to all those presentations, you may ask? The thing which is common to all these presentations is R, of course. And before doing my presentation, I will make a brief introduction about R for those who don't know R. So as you all do, I read the news today. And in the New York Times, what happened is like, we saw that in January 6, 2009 from the New York Times, the popularity of R at university could threaten SAS Institute. Second, two days after, January 8, 2009 from the New York Times also, Intel Capital has placed the number of R users at 1 million and up to 2 million, okay? So I'm going to make a brief introduction about R. I'm going to present briefly, like in 10 minutes, the R world. So what is R? As you all know, R is a free environment. This is a free software. It's freely available. It's a language. And it was designed by two people, and I would like to name them. First one, Rossi Hacker, and the second one is Robert Gentleman. And all the tutorials that you're going to have today are based on R packages. So how R became a master decade? Uh, its economic model, it's free. And the other one is that they said that we could have chosen to be commercial and we would have sold five copies of the software. And it happens now, now R has become very popular. So how so? This is the snowball effect I'm going to present you. And you all know about that term, the snowball effect. And what happened is I'm going to show you a quick graphical output. And you can see here, this is the number of what we call packages. And this is the time where you had all those packages in 2001 and 2009. And this is the log of this number here. And in 2001, we had 110 packages, while in 2009, we had more than 2,000 packages. And I think that now, we have something like three or 4,000 packages. So what is a package? And this is the key of the success of R, one of the key, I guess. So a package is something you want to create to present a method or to present a methodology, OK? And this is an R package. What's in the box? There's an old Bulgarian proverb that says, for each problem, there's an R package, OK? And one of the most famous R package is, of course, the Sodoku package. I'm not going to talk about that package, but you can see that with some knowledge in experimental design, you can create your own Sudoku and you can solve your own Sudoku. But now, what I'm going to talk about is our package. And I'm going to begin our tutorials with our package that we have created with Francois and which is called the Factor Minor package. Okay, so you have here a website, http factorminor.free.fr. Remember, it's free. And you have also a reference in Journal of Statistical Software, Factor Minor and our package for multivariate analysis. So I will try to mix both in that presentation the different features of the package. And also, I will try to show you how it works, OK? So it's going to be a little bit tricky for me because I know that each time you want to make a demo, it doesn't work. So I hope it's work. So once again, the name of the presentation is From Multivariate to Multiway Data Analysis, an overview. And we're going to have the journey together. And we'll try to find a way to mix one or to divide one single data table into a couple of data table to get some multi-way data table. So what do you expect from this tutorial? I will try to make you understand what can be expected from multi-way data methods, of course. And I will try to make you understand the motivations and the framework behind canonical analysis. I'm sure that you all know that method. So it will be kind of a quick reminder about that method and to understand also a very well-known and used method, which is called generalized canonical analysis. And finally, 
this is going to be our reference method because here we're in REN and we're working with multiple factor analysis. So I'll try to place multiple factor analysis versus generalized canonical analysis. The outline is kind of simple, is I'm going to present you what you know, what you want to do with some kind of data set, and why you want to do it. I'll try to do that. How to do it, and how to do it with R, and of course how to do it with the factor minor package. So before, I'm going to present you the data I'm going to use to uh, show you that factor minor package and its features. The data is about 40 mice, so it's an experiment that we've run here. So I think that most of my students know those data set. It's about 40 mice, two genotypes. The wild one, that means that we didn't touch those mice. And what we call the PPAR alpha deficient. I will talk about that concept later. And then, from those mice, we have submitted them to five different diets, okay? And I will explain to you what about the diets. And also, we have measured 120 genes, the expression of those genes. And also, we have measured 21 fatty acid concentration. So you have the picture. You have two different types of data. And you have, of course, continuous data, quantitative data. So what about PPAR alpha? <clears throat> As you can hear, see here, so this is a group of nuclear receptor proteins. It's proteins that function as transcription factors. So remember, I'm not going into too much details with those PPAR alpha uh, thing, but remember, in one case, you have those who have and those who don't, OK? So they play an essential role in the regulation of cellular differentiation, development, and metabolism. And that's why you have submitted those different uh, mice in five different diets, OK? So what about the diet? So we have, as I told you, two different diets. And this is the picture. Remember, we have continuous variables, but we also have categorical variables. The first one is a variable with two modalities, PPAR alpha deficient or wild. And the second one is the diet variable, another categorical variables with five modalities. DHA, EFAT, LIN, reference, and TSOL. So in those different diets, you have more or less omega-3. Okay? In the first one, you have a lot of omega-3. In the second one, less omega-3. And for some of them, it's a mix between omega-6 and omega-3. And there's another one, which is like uh, the human, I mean, ratio of omega-3 and omega-6. So the issues, of course, what we want to do is we want to understand the structure among the different mice according to the way they have been described in terms of genes and in terms of hepatic fatty acid expression, of course. We want to mix those two types of data. In some cases, we would like to describe the mice according to one point of view and not the other. And at the end, of course, from a multi-way point of view, we'd like to combine those two points of view and to see whether there is a common structure among the two data tables. So I'm going to do as if I was my child, my first PCA. So what about this first PCA here? PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis, of course. This is going to be my first PCA with supplementary qualitative variables, and of course, factor minor. OK, so this is my data set. And of course, those are my mice. Those are my diet. This is the genotype of my mice, OK? Whether they are wild, as you can see here, or whether they are PPAR alpha deficient. Those are my <coughs> fatty acid concentration. And those are my gene expression, OK? So of course, here, you have a mix of continuous variables, and you have a mix of categorical variables. And as you all know, you can only run a PCA on continuous variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider this data set here, that X data set, without the categorical variables. And we're going to run a principal component analysis on the whole data set, right? So this is going to be our first point of view. And we're going to see the structure. So on the next slide, you will have the different outputs, the different graphical outputs of factor minor. And then at the end, I will run a demo. And I will show you how 
it's easy to get those outputs. So if I run the analysis on the whole data set, combining the genes on the one hand, combining the expressions on the other hand, I'm going to run it because we have different unit of measurement. I'm going to run it on the correlation matrix. Okay, So I'm going to run a standardized PCA. So that sigma here is only my correlation matrix. And from this correlation matrix, remember I have only 40 individuals and I have 141 variables. So what I can get is that kind of graphical output. Okay, So this is directly an output from factor minor. First dimension, second dimension. Maybe you can see a structure here. Okay, It's like you have three groups of peoples. And from this structure, what I can do is, of course, I can project as supplementary elements my categorical variables. Okay, So what I want to do is I want to enhance that graphical output and to put some more information on it. So here, you will see that it's kind of very easy to put the center of gravity of the different categorical variables. Okay, So of course, my first original graphical output didn't change. The only thing I did is that I have projected as supplementary elements the center of gravity of each subpopulation per modality. Okay. Second one, what you can do, of course, is to color the individuals according to the fact that they are wild or the fact that their people are alpha deficient. So you can see here a clear structure. And we'll go into that structure later. And third one, in terms of supplementary information, of course, you'll see that you'll be able to project easily the second categorical variable, which is the diet. Okay. So in terms of diet, you have those five different diets. And also here, you can see a clear structure along the mice. This is my correlation circle. Okay, And in fact, what I did, for some convenient reasons, I will tell you why, what I did is I have selected some genes. So actually, instead of using 120 genes, I only used a bunch of those genes, like 20 genes okay, among those 120. So I have made the selection. And I have used also a selection of the um, fatty acid expression. So this is my, of course, correlation circle. And of course, you all know that to understand R, to interpret the axis, you have to combine both the individual's representation also with the variable representation. So that was my first PCA. I took the whole data set. My second PCA is I'm going to add not only the categorical variables as supplementary information, but I'm going also to add the continuous variables. Okay? So in that sense here, I'm going to change my point of view. So instead of using the whole variables, I'm going to use whether the point of view of the genes or the point of view of the fatty acid expression. And also, I'm going to enhance that with my categorical variables. So my second PCA, and here I put an S on data set. It's just because you may consider here two data sets. The first one, x1, is about the fatty acid expressions. And the second one is about the genes expression. And here, once again, you can see a structure coming on the first data set, on the x. Okay? So maybe it could be a good option to divide the big data set, the x data set, into two sub data sets, which I have called x1 and x2. And then. What I'm going to do, of course, is I'm going to use x1 as my reference variables. I mean that I'm going to use them to induce a structure on my individuals. And then I'm going to project the x2 as my supplementary variables. And I'll do the reverse. Okay? So <coughs> say I'm going to use x1. Okay? Of course, the graphical output has changed. But you can also see our clear structure. Of course. You can enhance that graphical output with supplementary information. And in that case, it's still my categorical variables. And of course, you can do that with 
the wild, the genotype, and you can do that with the diet. Okay? Same structure, almost the same structure. Okay? And here, as you can see here, I have used this fatty acid expression as active variables. So those are the one I have used to induce my structure. This is my point of view. And for a better understanding of this point of view, I have projected as supplementary elements the gene expression. In blue here, you have the gene expressions that are supposed to help you understanding the different dimensions that have been induced by the fatty acid expression. And if you consider X2 as your active set of variables, what you will get is the same type of structure. Okay? I'm going to go quickly on this one. Of course, the percentage of variability on each dimension has changed. You don't have the same number of variables and so on. The structure has changed. And as you can see here, the dark variables here, the black variables, are the active point of view. The point of view you're using to describe the mice. And the one in blue here are the supplementary variables. OK? So from the whole data set, we have divided it into two parts, x1 and x2. And then you can also divide the whole correlation matrix into four parts. First one, this one here, sigma 1, 1. Of course, this is the correlations among the variables of x1. Sigma 2, 2 is the correlation matrix among the variables of x2. And of course, you may be interested into that sigma 1, 2 and sigma 2, 1. And finally, considering the two data sets at the same time, it's like considering x12 as your object of interest. Okay? And this is what we're going to do. We're going to find a way to combine those two data sets for a better understanding of that correlation matrix here. So this is our close encounters of the third kind. We're going to mix those two data sets. And that's what, how we're going to combine the two structures. OK? So now you have a clear picture of what we want to do and where we want to do. Where we want to go, sorry. That was the multivariate part, OK? And before going into the uh, multi-way data analysis part, that means into the part where we combine the different data sets, I'm going to make a quick demo of factor minor. And I'm going to show you how we manage to get those graphical outputs. OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in R Commander for uh, convenient reasons. I have open R. And then what I did is that I have open R Commander. And as you can see here, we have integrated the factor minor package into R Commander. So I don't know if you know about R Commander. R Commander is only a graphical user interface of R, okay, and it has very nice features. First one, it's used by a lot of people. Second one, you can put your own package in the menu, okay? You can create what have been called R Commander plugin, okay? So in the R world, there's a bunch of R Commander plugin, and of course, Factor Minor is one of the R Commander plugin. And third nice feature is each time you click on one of the buttons of the um, menu, you will generate some code that will help you to learn the R language. So this is the third and best feature of the console. So this is my uh, mouse data set. I'm going to uh, click on Factor Miner. And as you can see here, we have implemented a lot of um, multivariate analysis. Principal component analysis, of course, correspondence analysis, multiple correspondence analysis, multiple factor analysis, hierarchical multiple factor analysis, factor analysis of mixed data, GPA, and so on. And there's also a very nice feature, I will talk to you about that, is description of the categories. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on principal component analysis. Okay? And if I click on this one, I have a bunch of variables I have to select to run my analysis. And if I don't do anything, 
the computer is going to select all the variables as active variables. So this is what I'm going to do. So first thing, I'm going to click on Apply. And then it will generate the same graphical output as you've seen previously. Okay? So here in this analysis, we have considered the whole X data set, okay? the whole genes, and also the whole fatty acid expression. And if you click on this, then, I'm sorry, you have the representation of the individuals. <clears throat> now, what do I want? Actually, what I want is also to enhance my graphical output with the categorical variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the diet and the genotype as supplementary factors. Okay? And if I do so, what I want to do also is I want to color my individuals according to their genotype. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to graphical options. I'm going to ask the computer to color my individuals according to the genotype. And I'm going to click on OK. And then I'm going to apply. And this is what you get. Black one are the non-wild, and the red one are the wild. It's that easy. And then, of course, if you want to perform another analysis in the sense that you want to change the set of variables you want to use to describe your individuals, this is what we're going to do. We're going to restart the analysis. And then I'm going to select another point of view. And the point of view I'm selecting is the fact that I'm considering the fatty acid expressions as my active variables, and the other one as supplementary variables. So if I click on this one, and if I click on supplementary variables, the computer is going to ask me which one of those variables do you want to choose as supplementary variables. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the genes as my supplementary variables. So this is my first point of view. And I'm going to drag it. OK. I'm going to select some supplementary factors. I'm going to click on graphical options. I'm going now to color my individuals according to the diet. This time, I'm going to click on OK. And then I'm going to click on Apply. And this is what you get. OK? The blue one are the genes. Those are my supplementary variables. This is very important. And the dark one are my fatty acid expressions. And if you click on the uh, graphical representation of the individuals, you will see here that you can see a clear structure according to the different diet. Now let's come back to the presentation. And what we want to do is now not only run some PCA and not only add some, I would say, supplementary information, but would like here to combine both. Okay? So we have to find a way to combine both data sets and to use them as active variables. I don't know if you have seen that movie, Rashomon. Who have seen that movie? So from my point of view, this is multi-way data analysis. Why is it so? Who knows the movie except you, Michael? So I recommend this movie. So tonight, if you don't have anything to do, you're not going to work, I guess. Or if you're not going to work, just rent the movie. So the film depicts the rape of a woman. OK, it's not very funny. But here, you have four witnesses, which is quite uncommon. So you have four points of view. And of course, what you want to do is you want to combine those points of view. You want to understand the truth. And the story are mutually contradictory, leaving the viewer you to determine where's the truth. So what you're looking for is you look for common factors. And you look also for specific factors. So what you want to do is you want to get a clear picture of all those different points of view, but you want to consider them as active variables. Okay? You want each one of the group of variables to express itself. So really, multi-way data analysis is like Rashomon, 
OK? So I'm going to talk to you about the objectives underlying the study of several groups of variables. Okay, So here, once again, in our case, we have only two groups of variables. But it happens that you have like a bunch of groups of variables. So what do you do with that? You want to weight the variables, as in the movie. Okay, It's not because someone is going to talk loud that you're going to consider what he's saying as more important as someone who's going to talk not that loud. Okay, So you have to think about how to weigh the variables. You have to think about how to look for common factors. So you want to get a unique framework to look for common factors. Okay, So to get a clear picture of different points of view, you want to mix them within a single framework. So you want also to compare those factors within that single framework. So we have to find a way to do that. And of course, you want to position each one of the group with respect to each other. And I'll talk, of course, about the superimposed representation. So about the weighting of the variables, you want to balance the influence of each group in a simultaneous analysis to balance it, which is really important. About the looking for common factors, you want to search factors that are common. And you want to compare them, as I told you. And you want also to get two people, two groups of variables, all the more close that they induce the same structure. Weighting of the variables. I'm going to talk about this one. So by analogy, it's like you're considering group of people. And when you consider a group of people, of course, you used to consider weight on those people. And you want to balance the weight of each group of the people. It is about the same with the variables. Here in our case, we had 120 genes. And we had only 21 fatty acid expression. So we have to find a way to balance the part of each group, to balance their point of view, the point of view they express. So this is going to be our reference example. In that case here, I have considered only two groups of variables. A first one, the orange one, which is really unidimensional, which means that I have two variables in this group here. And those two variables, they kind of express the same thing. You have a second group of variables with three orthogonal variables. Okay, So that means that they express three, I would say, different things, Okay, three different concepts. If you had to run a PCA on the whole data set, this is what you would get as a first principal component, OK? Because the first main dimension would be induced by the two orange one and the black one, which is here, OK? So 1, 1, 1 makes 3, and 3 wins against 1 and 1. If you want to balance the sets by the total inertia of each group, OK? So say you want to consider the first group. As I told you, first group, two variables. So it weights two, OK? One plus one. The second group is made out of three variables. So its weight in terms of inertia, if you consider standardized variables, is three. So if you weight each variable in terms of the total inertia of each respective group, you would get one divided by two, in that case, 0.5. And you would get one divided by three, in that case, it's 0.3. So that means that here, the main axis of variability for the first group is equal to 1, whereas the main axis of variability for the second group is equal to 0.3. So there's no way you will be able to compare the main axis of variability of each group. Hence the idea of multiple factor analysis. So the idea of multiple factor analysis, which is a reference method, it's only a point of view. I'm not saying that this is the point of view you should use. I'm just saying that this is the point of view that we use. It's like Rashomon. If you want to compare the main axis of variability induced by each group, our recommendation would be to divide the weight of each variable by the first eigenvalue of each separate analysis. So in that case here, you can clearly see that you have two variables in one group, those two variables are saying the same thing. So this is a very unidimensional point of view. 
So if you had to run a PCA on this group, you would get a first eigenvalue equal to 2, almost. Okay? And if you had to divide each variable by that first eigenvalue, you would get 1 divided by 2, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And then, if you had to sum it, okay, you would get here a one dimension of variability equal to 1. And for the second group, what would you get? You would get 1, 1, and 1. So the first eigenvalue would be equal to 1, of course, because the three variables are orthogonal. And if you had to weight each one of the variables by the first eigenvalue, you would get 1 divided by 1. So in that case, it means that the main axis of variability of each group is equal to 1 once it has been weighted. It's like in Rashomon. You have those four people here. And you want to compare them. Okay? So just take what's the most important information of each one of those four people. And once you have taken the most important information of each one of the four people, just balance that information. And you want to hear it once and to compare them within the single framework. So that's the idea of multiple factor analysis. So from this weighting, you have some kind of good properties. And among those good properties, for each group, the variance of the main axis of variability is equal to 1. No group can generate all by itself the first global axis. But a multidimensional group will contribute to the construction of more axes, whereas a unidimensional group will consider to the construction of only the first global axis. So the idea of multiple factor analysis is only about the weighting. But once you have that weighting, you have really good properties also. As it is considered as a principal component analysis where variables have been weighted, you have, of course, the transition formula in PCA. You have the graphical output of the individuals and of the variables, of course. And you have a very nice properties, which is here, which is MFAs like PCA when you consider each group as one variable. Okay? So you have that strict equivalency here. Uh, and as we are in the... Um, exploratory multivariate analysis framework. For multiple factor analysis, you have, of course, the coordinates of the individuals. But also, as it's a geometrical framework, you can also get the contributions of the individuals, the squared cosines, the quality of representation of the variables, and so on. So this is what you would get if you run a multiple factor analysis. In that case here, you would consider all the variables at the same time, but also the structure among the variables. That means that you would consider, on the one hand, the 120 genes, on the other hand, the 21 fatty acid expression. This is what you would get also. Here, a representation of all the individuals. And of course, as you have seen previously, as the structure are quite common among the two groups, this is the consensus representation. So this is the mix of the two points of view with exactly the same feature as in PCA because you can also represent some more uh, graphical information from the um, categories. And now we want to see whether the structures are coming or not. So this is about setting up common factors. Why did I take that picture? I took that picture here because we are within a single framework. It's a one picture thing. It's a single framework. But here, we have two different points of view, right? Who can see clearly the old lady? Who can clearly see the young woman? So two points of view in a very single framework. And what we want to do is we want to see what is common? The commonality is here. What is specific from each group? Which is specific from each group is the fact that some of you are looking for an old woman, whereas some others are looking for a young woman. OK? So this is all about setting up common factors, looking for common things. 
and looking for specific things, right? So <clears throat> we'll use a reference method that you all know. And the reference method is canonical analysis. OK? So canonical analysis is having two points of view that are kind of similar. OK? In that case, here I have my two data sets. And what I want to do, of course, you know that word canonical. It comes from the Greek. That means the ruler. OK? And in French, we have that expression, but I won't translate it, which is a canon. But what we want to do is we want to find the two linear combinations of variables, one for each group, which are the most highly correlated. OK? So we're going to take one linear combination from one group, one linear combination from the other group, and we'll try to find the best linear combination that fits. OK. It's the same trick. Do you see a factor come onto the two clouds? I don't think so. But then, maybe there's one. A, B, C, A, B, C. This is what we're going to do. So in the case of canonical analysis, what we'll do is we'll look for jointly linear combinations of this set here and the other set here. And we'll try to maximize the correlation coefficient about the, among those two linear combinations. Okay? So what I've done here is that I've used the uh, Kankor function okay, to uh, run my canonical analysis. And how do you read that kind of thing? So we are still in R. And those are the uh, correlation coefficients among my two canonical variables. And those are the different coefficients for the first canonical variables and for the second canonical variables. And as you can see here, you have the name of the variables and you have the linear combinations. Okay? And you have your canonical variables. Of course, you can get those canonical variables under specific conditions because it's all about regression. It's all about multiple regression. So here you have all the different drawbacks of multiple regression. As you can see here, I have calculated the correlation matrix among my different gene expression. Okay? And I found two genes here, alpine and alpine 1, okay, for which I have a correlation coefficient of 0.97. But still, when I look at my first canonical variables, I can see here that the two coefficients, they don't have the same sign. This is something which is very common in multiple regression when you have too many variables, of course. You all know that thing. So now we have that canonical analysis, our two-set framework, and we want to generalize it for several sets of variables. And for several sets of variables, of course, you have several pictures of the same thing, and you want to get the common factors. So there's something different from the two sets framework. Because the thing which is different is that here, I have created a new picture. Because in that case, I have to find a variable which would be the most correlated to each linear combination for each group. I'm not going to look directly for linear combinations who are connected. I have to find another way not to compare things two by two. But you all know that. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to find a variable, let's call that ZS, okay, such as the sum over the air square of this variable with all the variables of all the groups, kj, is big as it can, okay? So the only difference between the two sets framework and the multiple sets framework, I would say, is that ZS here. So I need an, something more. Of course, from a geometrical point of view, this is what you get. Okay, You have those different sets of variables. And you try to find that component that I would call FS. Okay? 
I'll call that FS because in the multiple factor analysis framework, we call that FS. And we'll try to find that FS such as that determination coefficient is maximum. And the problem is, still, if you have three variables of the same set which are very correlated, the problem is a problem of multicollinearity. Okay? So that's why they have developed, and hence I would say, generalized canonical analysis, rich canonical analysis, and so on. Anyway, what we want to do is we want to think about another coefficient. So instead of the R square, what could be useful? So we find we have to find another criterion, right? So in multiple factor analysis, it's exactly the same framework. We'll have to find a ZS, another component, which would maximize another criterion. Okay, so we're not going to use that R square, but we're going to use what we have defined as the LG measure. So it's exactly the same slide as previously. Okay, so instead of taking that R square, I'm going to move from the R square to the LG measure. Okay, and if you look at that formula, it's exactly the same thing. So from a certain point of view, multiple factor analysis is exactly as generalized canonical analysis. That's the first message. But we have changed the criterion. So what is the LG measure? The LG measure, with the weighting of the multiple factor analysis is defined this way. So it's comprised between 0 and 1. What does 0 mean? What does 1 mean? When you have a male value of 0, so once again, this is the LG measure among one variable and a set of variables. So if it's equal to 0, it would mean that, as you can see in the formula, none of the variables of the set that you're considering are related to that z. So everything is orthogonal. Okay? So z is orthogonal to each one of the variables of the set that you're considering. If it's equal to 1, that means that z is the first principal component of the set kj. So instead of considering the r square, we're going to consider the notion of inertia. Okay? So if you consider the notion of inertia, this is all about principal component analysis, of course, and you don't really care about multicollinearity. So one way to circumvent the problem of multicollinearity is to consider, instead of the R square measure, that LG measure. And of course, if you have that multicollinearity problem, you will find a good component, a good component in the sense of the stability. Okay, so we're not talking once again about R square. We're going to talk about LG. And first point that you have to have in mind is that multiple factor analysis can be really considered as a generalized canonical analysis. Okay, we'll try to find some variables that are not the most correlated in the sense of the R square, but that are very related in the sense of the LG measure. A quick demo before I want to talk about the superimposed representation of the clouds of individuals, to show you <coughs> how you can get easily to different graphical outputs. So I'm going to cancel, click on this one. I'm going to close those. And I'm going to go in our commander. If you go in our commander, go then to factor minor, choose multiple factor analysis. And the idea here is that you have to select groups of variables. Okay? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to add a first quantitative group. So the computer is asking me, okay, take a group, name it, and choose his status in the analysis. Means that do you want it active or group or supplementary group. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose as the first group my fatty acid expression. Here we are. 
I'm going to call it. Where is it? Okay. I'm going to consider it as an active group in the analysis. Okay. And I'm going to scale the variable within the group. And I'm going to click on OK. So here we have a first group. But multiple factor analysis wouldn't be multiple factor analysis without more groups than one. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another group which is here, and I'm going to consider the genes. Okay, click on this one. And then I forgot to name my group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this, I'm going to modify my group, and I'm going to change its name. It's that easy. So I'm going to name it now, and I'm going to call it genes, and see what happens. Okay and then I'm going to apply. Here we are. Within the single framework, remember the picture? We have combined the information on the two groups as active groups. But we also have weighted the part of each group, which is really important. First graphical output. This one is the representation of the group we're going to talk later. This one is the representation of my two groups of variables. OK? So see here, I don't know if you do remember the two separate analyses. OK? I don't know if you do remember them, but here, when we have applied that multiple factor analysis, we have found a way to like some kind of rotate the information from each one of this group. And you have a common structure here as a mix of green and red variables. Okay? I don't know if you do remember the analysis performed on X1 and then on X2. If you perform the analysis on X1 and you add as supplementary variables the variables of X2, you don't find that thing here. The fact that you can see here a mix among the two sets of variables. And this is going to be a way we're going to use to determine whether the factors are common or not. So let's come back to the presentation. And let's talk about the superimposed representation of the J clouds of individuals. <coughs> so as you can see here, I have considered separately each group. Okay? So if you do consider separately each group, say you have J groups, then you have j different spaces, OK? And say for each one of the group, I'm sorry about that, you have k j variables, OK? You have induced k j dimensions for each one of the group, OK? So what do you want to do? You want to take the point of view of each one of the variables, OK? And you want to represent not only the consensus, but you also want to represent the points of view individually, I would say. The reference method that you all know is Procastis analysis. How to compare clouds representing the same objects, but in different space. So, as you all know, Procastis was the character of Greek myth. And indeed, what he was doing was chopping head and so on, just to find a way to uh, fit people in a single framework. If they were longer, then he would cut off their feet. If they were shorter, he would stretch them. So it's all about trying to find some kind of configurations okay, to have a fit of all the different configurations. So this is our reference example. A, B, C, and three points of view, first one, second one, third one. And then we put them within a single same work, and we flip and rotate and so on. So this is what GPA does. <coughs> the idea is that the different clouds induced by the different groups of variables must be well represented. 
Okay, so that means that if they are well represented, the points, as you can see here, that represent the same individuals must be close to one another. This is what you get here. The points that represent the same individuals must be close to one another. The C must be together, the A must be together, and the B must be together. So what do we do? We're going to use the geometrical framework to present how those partial individuals are calculated, are output in multiple factor analysis. So the idea here is to consider the whole space. So as I told you, at the very beginning, we had x. And then we divided that x into two parts. So this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to consider the whole space with all the variables. And then we're going to project each point of view within that whole space, each point of view meaning the subspaces induced by each set of variables. So this is exactly what you have here. The whole space is only the sum over the different spaces that you have subdivided, OK? And what we do in multiple factor analysis is we just project the partial individuals induced by each group onto the whole space. <coughs> the partial clouds are projected onto the principal components of the mean cloud. And it happens that it works. It works as in GPA. We have exactly the same concept. And this is what you get from that superimposed representation. The superimposed representation and the canonical variables provided by multiple factor analysis express a very same problematic, since they correspond to the same point of view, meaning that what you want to do is you want to have all the different points of view close together, close, and you want, once again, the C all together, the A all together, and the B all together. So the nice feature about multiple factor analysis is that it lies on geometrical properties, meaning that we had those transition formula in PCA. We still have those transition formula with partial representations. OK, so I have expressed here the famous transition formula that you usually use when you run a PCA, meaning that an individual is on the side, I would say, of the variables for which it takes high values, and on the opposite side of the variables for which it takes low values, OK? And that formula which work for the consensus works also for the partial individuals, OK? So those are the partial transition relationship that are defined this way. I is my individual, and J is the point of view of the J group for this individual, OK? So that means that here, if you have two points of view, you have, for each one of your individuals, you have a partial representation. Meaning that here, this point should be the partial representation according to the gene expression, whereas this point here should be <laughs> sorry, the partial representation according to the fatty acid expression. And as I told you, the transition formula they work as well for the partial representations, meaning that here, according to this point of view, this individual 3, 4, 1 is more extreme than according to this point of view. OK? Because on the second dimension and on the first dimension, this individual representation is more extreme than this one, which is closer to the average. One way to look at, a, at those graphical output is just only to represent those individuals for which you have high variability among the representations or very low variability among the representations. Meaning that when you have a high variability among the partial representation, that means that the two points of view are kind of specific for this individual. Okay? And when you have low variability among the partial representation, that means that the two points of view are kind of close. 
What about the global representations of sets of variables? So as I told you, the aim, finally, is to have a look at your whole data set, but to consider the different objects, which are the individuals, the variables, and the groups of variables. Okay? So here, we're going to consider the point of view from the group of variables. Okay? This is going to be about the global representations of sets of variables. So what we want to do here is we want to represent one group and to position each one of the group among the others. Okay? So here, once again, what we'll do is we consider separately each data set. Okay? So if we have capital J groups, we'll have capital J scalar product matrices. Because we have to consider these matrices because the bad thing is, of course, you can get a number of variables different from one group to the other, right? As in our example, the group concerning the gene expression is made out of 120 genes, okay? And the one for the fatty acid expressions is made out of 21 variables. So you have to compare two groups with many different number of variables per group. So the only common dimensions among those groups, the only way to define them commonly is to consider the number of variables. And of course, the number, uh, the number of individuals, I'm sorry. And of course, the number of individuals is the same for each one of the data set. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider, instead of the data set, we're going to consider the structure induced by the data set through the scalar product matrix. Okay? So we don't have the raw data set anymore. We just have the scalar product matrices for each one of the data set. Okay? And of course, the scalar product matrix is a square matrix. Okay? And the number of dimensions, I would say the number of rows and the number of columns, is simply equal to the number of individuals. Okay? So for each one of my groups of variables, with eventually different number of variables per group, what you will consider is the scalar product matrix among the individuals, of course. So the idea here is to represent one scalar product matrix. The reference method to do so is the so-called status method. So the idea of this presentation, I'm sure that you got the idea, was to place multiple factor analysis among the different reference methods. Okay? Generalized canonical correlation analysis, then Procustes analysis, then the status method. So for the global representation of the set of variables, what we do is we're going to consider the components induced by the consensus. Remember, we have run our principal component analysis on the different data sets that have been weighted. So we have obtained our canonical variables that we have called ZS or that we have called FS. From that FS, what we're going to do, we're going to consider the scalar product matrix among our individuals, but depicted according to the FS only. So instead of calculating that xj, x prime j, x prime is the uh, transpose of x, we're going to calculate fs, f prime s. Okay? So we're going to consider as a basis a group of one variable only. Okay? And each one of those variables will be the principal components induced by the global analysis. So, as I told you, studying that cloud, NJ, in other words, the cloud of the groups of variables, has been studied by status, which is a reference method. Okay? So, instead of considering a principal component analysis of those objects here, trying to maximize, as in PCA, the inertia of the uh, matrices projected, what we're going to do is we're going to 
project the scalar product matrices on the fs f prime s so here we have our scalar product matrix okay and what we are going to do remember here we are in the space r i square meaning that we are in the space of the scalar product matrix we're going to project on the components here the components induced by multiple factor analysis those scalar product matrix and this is what we get and it happens that within that framework we have very nice properties because we know how to interpret the position of the groups among each other and we know how to interpret the coordinate of one group on each one of the component how is it so so the secret here is that thanks to the weighting of the variables the coordinate of one group is exactly equal to his lg measure of the component and the group meaning that here as you can see all the groups they lie within a square o101 it's not a correlation circle it's a square from 0 to 1 and the coordinate of the group 1 for instance on the first component is exactly equal to the lg measure of that first component and the group here the coordinate of the group 1 on the second component is exactly equal to the lg measure of the second component and the variables of the group here so we have a representation of the groups that you can interpret in terms of coordinates two groups are all the more close that they induce the same structure on the individuals which is a nice thing inducing the same structure in the sense of PCA and finally thanks to the weighting the coordinate of my variables lies between 0 and 1 and is exactly equal to 1 when the main dimension of variability of my group is equal to <laughs> the dimension that I've considered when I've projected my group okay that was all for the theoretical part so once again I'd like to thank you for being here but I'm not done considering the demo so I'm going to keep on for a few minutes <coughs> on the demo of factor minor I still have a um, couple of minutes and then you'll be able to uh, ask me some questions so I'm going to start from the beginning but you know the picture now and starting from the beginning is also talking about some nice features that I haven't shown you in the presentation so before going from multivariate to multi-way analysis I would say from univariate to multivariate point of view so the univariate point of view I'm going to consider is the point of view that we're going to express with that function here which I will have called description of categories so this is how we would start an analysis okay so let's say we want to understand before running some multivariate analysis let's say we want to understand the diet variable or the uh, genotype variable okay I'm going to click on this one I'm going to choose to describe the diet and going to choose to describe it according to all my variables of all my data set so we're like in a data mining framework so what we're going to do right now is like we're going to run some kind of analysis of variance automatically and we're going to submit okay what do we have here I'm sorry I'm going to rerun again 
So as you can see here, it's very convenient if you want to rerun that because it has generated the code automatically. And I'm going to submit. And what you can get is you can get an automatic description of each one of the modalities of your variable of interest. OK? So say we are interested into that diet variable. That diet variable is made out of five categories. OK? And in that case here, the computer has described automatically each one of the category in terms of the continuous variables and the categorical variables in the data set. As you can see here, I don't know where's the pointer, that DHA diet was described by those fatty acids and those genes expression. Okay? And here we have some indicators that will tell you whereas the value of those variables are higher significantly are higher than the average or are lower. Okay? So in that case here, how can you read that kind of thing? You can say that for DHA, you have a higher value for these fatty acid expressions than for the overall diet. And here, for this fatty acid expression, you would rather have a mean in the category in DHA, which is lower than the overall mean. Okay? So this is an automatic description of your different modalities. Okay? Of course, you will be able to do that for all the categorical variables. Okay? So it's only analysis of variables. It's only so, sorry, analysis of variance, but that has been run automatically. And you can also describe continuous variables. Now, once you have done all those univariate analyses, let's run my PCA and go into more details. So first PCA, you've seen this one before. I'm going to do that. I'm going to click on this one. I'm going to select my supplementary factors. I'm going to use those one. OK. I'm going to have a look at my graphical options. I'm going to apply. And the idea is that once you have the graphical output, of course, you have generated some indicators. So those indicators, as you can see here, are in an object that we have called RES, RES for result. That stands for result. Okay? And what's inside that object? We're going to call that object. And inside that object, you have a different indicators. You have the eigenvalues. You have the coordinates of the variables, of course. You have their contributions. You have their quality of representation. The same for the individuals. Okay? And now, let's have a look at RES eigenvalues. Okay? And this is the output that you will get. And of course, it works for all the different output that have been defined here. Okay, so you have the eigenvalue, you have the percentage of variance explained by each one of the x's, and the cumulative percentage of variance. And if you want to have the coordinates of your individuals, of course, you have to call the name of the object again, and you have to, I'm sorry, I'm so, yeah. I know that someone is following. And you have, of course, the coordinates of your individuals. So you have everything that you may expect from a PCA, the graphical output as well as the indicators. And this is, I would say, um, the geometrical point, point of view. But then, what do we have more? We have more than that. We have the feature that will allow you to describe automatically each one of the dimensions induced by your PCA. So this is what we're going to do. So remember, we have created an object. And in that object, we have put all the different indicators induced by PCA. So I'm going to <coughs> automatically describe the dimensions induced by PCA. 
So the function I'm going to use is this one. I'm going to describe the dimensions, hence the name, dimdesk, of my object of interest, which is my result of the object. Okay? So I'm going to run the analysis. And as you can see here, I can get an automatic description of my dimensions. So in terms of continuous variables, this is what comes first. OK? So in terms of continuous variables, those are the variables that are the most related to my first principal component. OK? Now, in terms of categorical variables, you can see that, according to the structure that you have seen, the two variables that you have considered, the genotype as well as the diet, have something to do with that first principal component. Okay? So you can describe that first principal component by the continuous variables that are here, but also by the two categorical variables. And now, still, I would say from a lower point of view, if you consider the only categories, you can describe your first dimension by those different diets that are here, and also, of course, the genotype. So remember, you have a function that will allow you to describe the dimensions automatically according to the variables that you have put in your analysis, okay? Whether they are active variables or supplementary variables, okay? Another feature. We're going to go to a principal component analysis again and say we want to uh, cluster our different mice, okay? So I'm going to uh, stand on the same point of view. I'm going to choose those variables as my point of view, okay? And I'm going to say I want to cluster my individuals after my principal component analysis, OK? So what do we do right now? What we do is we take the principal component analysis and we perform a hierarchical classification on those components, OK? And <coughs> we're asking him to keep in mind the first five dimensions. And then after that, we're going to uh, choose our clusters interactively, OK? We're not going to let him choose the clusters by itself. And then I'm going to click on OK. So after that, the computer is asking you, how many groups do you want, OK? So this is following the principal component analysis. You can choose the natural cut, I would say. You can choose the cut which is proposed by the computer, or you can choose another cut. Okay? So say we use the natural cut. I'm going to click on this one. And then what you will get is the two representations provided by the regular PCA, I would say, but also this one. Cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, cluster 4. You will get a color representation of your individuals according to the groups they belong to, OK? And then, remember, we have used that decat function previously. We have used the function that will allow you to describe automatically a categorical variable. So what we did is that we have used that function also to describe automatically your groups of individuals. So here, if we go here, in what you can get is an automatic description of your group of individuals. See here? How can you read that? The individuals that belong to group one are described or can be described by those variables, okay? 
And for those variables, they would rather take high values, as you can see here, because the mean in the category is higher than the overall mean. And they would rather take low values for those fatty ex acid expression. As you can see here, the mean in the category is lower than the overall mean. OK, so remember, from univariate to multi-way, multi from univariate to multivariate data analysis, it's using the different functions that will allow you to describe automatically categorical variables and so on. With factor minor, you can also perform classification. OK. And what do we have, finally? Another nice feature, and, and I'll end by this one. Is this. OK? Remember, those variables that automatically describe my dimension, I may want to use this kind of graphical output at the same time. So here, I have performed my principal component analysis on those variables. You have the possibility to move the different labels, which can be helpful when you try to understand the data. And also, what you can get here is the possibility to integrate the result from the automatic description into your graphical output. And those variables here are the one that are the mostly correlated to the first principal component analysis. Or one feature would be to uh, represent the individuals according to their quality of representation. Thank you for being here.